Vix presents Dangerously Yours, a half hour of romance and adventure starring Victor Jory in God's Country and the Woman. You know, more and more millions of people are using Vix Vatronol nose drops to relieve distress of head colds, benefit by their experience. And now, Dangerously Yours. I am Adventure. In my name, men have traversed the highways, the byways, the skyways of the world. I am the fire that burns in the heart of youth, that makes men dream and dare and conquer. I am dangerously yours. Today, follow me to the great Canadian Northland. Meet one of the gallant adventurers of fiction, a two-fisted fighting man who steps from the pages of God's country and the woman. coming events could actually cast their shadows before, I would have known the answer and the end and the solution to the whole problem the first time I heard their cries. Yes, I would have known that the answer was there, square in the teeth of 40 Alaskan huskies, animals more wolf than dog, that were part of the threat and the wildness of God's country. Animals that knew but one authority, the girl of God's country, Josephine Adair. I met her late one summer afternoon. I was headed for Montreal after 18 months far above the Arctic Circle. I came around the bend of a lake, and there she was, Josephine Adair. Her copper-colored hair touched with sunlight, and behind her the birches, the blue sky, and the snow. And a phrase I had known all my life became rooted and full of meaning. No country is God's country without a woman. And here, without a bit of warning, was the one woman in the world for me. I knew it instantly. Well, say. Well, for the... What in the world are you doing here? I... I thought you were someone else. Now, wait, wait, wait just a minute. Where are you going? What are you doing out here? I live across the lake. I'll have to go. No, please, please don't go. I've been looking for you for a long time. Looking for me? You mean you know who I am? Oh, no, I I was speaking strictly from the heart. I've been up in the Arctic, and I'm just coming down. I haven't seen a white woman in two years, and so you can't blame me for being a bit enthusiastic, can you? No, perhaps not. Gosh, you're beautiful. I used to do a lot of thinking about a girl like you up there, but I never thought I'd find one. <laughs> I think you'd say that to any woman you met right at this moment. I might. But I wouldn't say it to any woman. You're the kind of a girl that belongs in my particular scheme of things. A girl that looks well against a lake and a northern sky and... and... Hey, hey. Hey, wait a minute. What are you crying about? Oh, I'm sorry. I... I didn't mean to frighten you. I'm not frightened. I just... Oh, I don't know. It isn't important. What's your name? Josephina Dear. Well, Josephine Adair, my name's Philip Wayman. Is something wrong? Is there anything I can do to help you? No. I thought for a moment that you might help me, but I can't ask you. I simply can't ask you. Why can't you ask me? Who do you want killed? Oh, look, I'd I'd really like to help you. Maybe I can. What's the trouble? Tell me about it. I can't. I just can't. Oh, now listen, sister, it can't be anything that bad. It's hard to believe that a girl who looks as fine and honest as you, as fine and honest as you are, can be in too deep. But I am. Then let me help you. You don't know what you're letting yourself in for. You might have to fight for me, and you might have to fight for your own life without knowing why. And you'd never find out the truth or the reason in a thousand years. Okay. I still want to help you. What do I do? What would you say if... if I asked you to become my husband for a month? A month? I'll take that on for a lifetime. No, seriously. I want you to come with me to my home. I want you to pretend to be my husband for one month. And at the end of that month, my problem will be solved. And then you must go away and never come back, and I'll tell all the people who have met you that you met your death in the forest. I think I'd rather marry you and live. That can never happen. All right, Josephine, you're a nice kid. And you're in trouble. 
And I always did have an eye for a lady in distress. I'm yours for a month. But you... You can't blame me for hoping that before the month is over, I can make you fall in love with me. If I did fall in love with you, it would still have to end in the same way. I'm telling you that very frankly and honestly. Are you still willing to help? Will you do it my way? Yes, I still want to help. And I'll do it your way. Look. Look, there's a canoe cutting across the lake towards us. Friends of yours? Oh, it's... It's Jean Croisset, my good friend. He's come for me. Please, will you leave me here alone? There are some things I must discuss with him. By tonight, I'll be ready to return home. Will you meet us here at moonrise? Yes. I'll be here. Thank you for your understanding. Thank you for your trust. Mr. Wayman? Yes? I'm Jean Croce. Josephine is waiting for us in the canoe. We are ready to go if you are. I'm ready. There is something I must say to you, monsieur. Josephine trusts you. There are not many men she would trust, but she has placed it with you. In your action now lies life or death for you, depending on your loyalty to her. I warn you, you will be a man in the middle. who will want to kill you. Yeah? There have been people who wanted to kill me before. I don't kill easy. Very well, monsieur. Come on. We started off across the lake, Josephine and Jean Croce and I. The lake was silver with moonlight and stars that were like a silver frosting on the sky. And skimming across the glassy smoothness of the lake into mystery and unknown danger, I was full of determination to solve the mystery and win the girl or die in the attempt. Philip, you're so quiet. What are you thinking? I was thinking of you. You know, I'm beginning to be sorry that I asked for your help. You're going to hate me when you reach a dear house. This afternoon, that didn't matter. Or at least I thought it didn't. And does it matter now? Yes. Yes, it does matter now. It matters so much that suddenly my... My heart is like ice. Josephine, I love you. Don't you understand that? Whatever I find at a dare house will make no difference. I wish I could believe that. Oh, Philip, I wish I could believe that. Tell me what is wrong. Let me try to help you. Let me try to find the solution. Let me try to find the answer. There is no real solution. There is no answer. The answer was there. The answer was there the moment we beached the canoe, although not one of the three of us sensed it. The answer came storming out of the night to greet us. Hello, Captain Hugh! Hello, old boy! Did you miss me? Down, Major, down. Nice boy, down now, down. Phyllis, this is Captain, my lead dog. Put your hand on his head. I want him to know you. Hello, hello, Captain, old boy. Forty savage dogs that would snap a bone like a twig leapt about her, reaching up to lick her face in her hands, and she stood surrounded by shaggy heads and gleaming fangs. She was completely without fear. She loved them, and they knew it. We left the pack of dogs with Jean. It had begun to snow as we walked towards the house, and once there... I'm giving you this room, Philip. Thank you. Excuse me while I speak to my servants. I'll only be a few minutes. I sat down on the edge of the bed, looking about the room. Something drew my gaze to the window, and my blood chilled, for there was a face pressed against the pane. A face dark and sinister, with eyes that shone and glittered like a beast. A face filled with hatred that was almost madness. And the face was that of Jean Croisset. And then his hand came up level with his eyes, and in his hand was a pistol. I stood there frozen for an instant, and then before I could move, Josephine entered. The face disappeared as quickly as it came. And then in the distance... Listen, Philip. That's Joe Labonte's dog team. I know the cry of the lead dog. He's bringing my father and stepmother. Come with me quickly. There's something I want to tell you, something I must show you before they arrive. I hope they wouldn't be coming so soon, but since they have come, we must meet the situation immediately. Oh, oh, oh. <laughs> 
Gosh, what a cute baby. He isn't very well. He's had a touch of fever. He's my little boy, Philip, two years old. Now do you understand? Yes, now I understand. This is to be my son. Yes. You, if you wish to change your mind, if you hate me now that you know, it's all right, Philip. I wouldn't blame you. <laughs> Will you look at that little beggar holding on to my finger? Ah, uh, he and I are going to get on great together. Hey, darned if he doesn't even look like me. A little oh, bit. Philip. Philip. Your father and stepmother, they don't know about him? No, they've, they've been away. My father's been ill. This is the first time he's been home in more than two years. My stepmother went to Montreal to see him, and they were married there. I wrote them about the baby. There wasn't anything else to do. I told them I had married a man named Philip Darkambo. If my father knew the truth, the real name of the baby's father, I think he would kill me. Is that the danger you thought was so terrible? No. That's the reason for the danger. But not the danger. Philip, stay here. Stay here. All right, now, all right. Take it easy. Come along and introduce me to my father and my mother-in-law. Do you hate me now? No, darling, I love you. And I don't believe one word you've said about this baby. There's a reason for all this, and I intend to find it out. You'll never find out anything more than you know right now. My problem has no answer. There is always an answer. Josephine! Josephine, where are you? Come on, honey, I'm going to like my father-in-law. I can tell by his voice. Father! Oh, Father, well, darling, I'm so glad to see you. Josephine, well, well, my dear. You look like a picture, doesn't she, Miriam? She looks beautiful. Father, this is Philip. How do you do, sir? I'm mighty pleased to meet you, Philip. Miriam, this is Philip. My stepmother, Philip. How do you do? How do you do? Could we see the baby now, Josephine? Why, of course. He's right here. Right here in my room. Say now... Isn't that something? May I hold him just for a moment? Just for one moment? Why, of course. Of course, Miriam. Neither John Adair or Miriam could take their eyes off that baby. And there was something in Miriam's face when she reached out her arms for the baby that made you want to weep. I left them there and went back to my room. I had left the lamp burning, but now the room was dark. And a cold wind swept through it from an open window... I lit the lamp, and then the shot came through the window. It hit my arm. I was so mad I hardly felt it. I, I jumped through the window and ran through the snow. I could see a man darting in and out of the trees ahead. I followed him. And as I ran, I could hear him shouting to his dogs. And then I was upon him. I've taken enough of you, Corsay. You fool, I kill you. Yeah? Well, you dirty, rotten sneak. You filthy... Drop that knife. Very, I do not have the time to fight with these monsieur. Oh. So sorry, monsieur, for the blow on the head. Someone is coming. Toro will return and we will fight this out some other day when I have more time. Push me, sir! Push! In just a moment, we will bring you the second act of God's Country and the Woman. Friends, here's some timely advice. Folks everywhere are sniffling and sneezing and catching summer colds that settle in the head and cause all-over misery. If you're unlucky enough to be one of them, remember there's one mighty effective way to relieve the sniffly and sneezy distress. That's with Vicks Vatronol. When you put a few drops of this specialized medication in each nostril, you can feel it start to work instantly, bringing relief right where trouble is. Vatronol is so good because it does three things on the nose. It soothes the irritation, it reduces swollen membranes, and it helps clear stuffy congestion. As a result, Vatronol makes breathing easier and brings you grand comfort. So remember, friends, when a summer head cold gives you the sniffles and sneezes, try Vatronol. Just follow the simple directions in the folder. Vicks Vatronol Nose Drops. And now, the second act of Dangerously Yours, starring Victor Jory in... God's Country and the Woman. Captain! Captain Quiet! We have everyone in the house out here. Oh. Quiet! Oh, 
Praise le bon Dieu. Oh. He's not that hurt. Oh, that devil, Thoreau. Oh. Monsieur. Monsieur. You've had a bad blow in the head. Here, have a swallow of brandy. I don't need your brandy, Cosse. Let's finish the fight. Fight, monsieur? Yes, you were ready to fight a moment ago. I was not fighting. I just found you. I hear Captain Howling from the house. I come out to see what was the matter. I found You're you. You're a liar. I saw you looking through my window with a gun in your hand, and then you came back later and tried to kill me when I lit the lamp. But I have not been near your windows. I tell you, I saw you. One face looks very like another looking through the window in the dark. I tell you, I'll mistake. You must believe me. Yeah? Then who did shoot at me? Do you know? I think I know. Then tell me. I cannot tell you. If I did, it might mean ruin for everyone in the house. Because that day I would go after the man. When he come face to face with him, it would bring the world crashing about his ears. Then I'll go after the man myself and kill him. No, no, not yet. Not yet. We have a gang to deal with, not just one man. I'm only interested in one man. The man that shot at me through the window. The father of that baby. Why do you say it is the father of the baby? I just feel it, that's all. I'm going after him and find out, and then I'm going to kill him. That's the only way to deal with a man like that. That's the only answer. Josephine, where are you going? Darling, you shouldn't be out of bed. I'm going to see one of the neighbor's children that's sick. I'm taking some medicine to him. No, dear, you mustn't go out of this house. I've got to. There's no one else to go, and the child might die. Philip, how do you feel? I feel all right, just a little banged up, that's all. I was so frightened last night you might have been killed. Philip, I've been thinking this over, and I've decided that you must leave. It isn't fair for me to endanger your life. No, no, you don't. I'm seeing this thing through. I have a personal score to settle now. You see, I don't like being hit over the head with a rifle butt. And you know something? I heard a name last night, or dreamt it, I don't know which. But it keeps going around and around inside my head, and that name was... Thoreau. Thoreau. I see you know the name. Yes, I, I know the name. Who is he? He's the leader of a band of murderers and thieves. He's a terrible man, Philip. Uh-huh. He's the baby's father, too, isn't he? Isn't he? I thought that was it. Do you love him? I despise him. Did you ever love no. him? No. Is that your baby, Josephine? I've told you that it is. I know, but I don't believe you. You agreed not to ask questions. You agreed to help me and go. I told you you'd never understand. No, but you're mistaken. I'm beginning to understand a lot of things, and before I'm through, I'll understand a good deal more. Philip, I don't want your help anymore. Please, will you go and let me fight this out alone? No, I will not. Then you'll be forcing me to go to Thoreau. That is ridiculous. It happens to be true. Josephine, who is the mother of that baby? Please, please, not so loud. Josephine, do you want your father to hear you? I'm sorry, Miriam. Philip, there's no point in continuing this discussion. You... you don't seem surprised at what I've been saying, Miriam. Miriam knows about the baby, Philip. I told her. In the name of heaven, is there anyone who doesn't know? John knows, Miriam knows, Thoreau knows. My father doesn't know. Oh. If he did know the truth, I think it would kill him. Yes, that's the whole point, isn't it? Your father. Your father must not know. You have a rather understanding father, Josephine. My father loathes Thoreau. He'd never understand for a moment. Why are you looking so frightened, Miriam? Uh, What's wrong? Nothing. I, I'm just so afraid John will hear you. Philip, if you want to come with me, come on. I have to get started. All right, darling. All right. <laughs> oh, Philip, I'm all out of breath. Well, we've been running for over a mile. We have to stop. Anyhow, there's a log across the road. Stop, Captain. Stop. Stop. Oh, oh. That's a wonderful day, isn't it? The sun and the snow in the sky and you beside me. Darling. Say, if your name was not Josephine Adair, if it was Mary Smith and you had no problems, what would you say to me at this moment? I suppose I would say, uh, I love you, Philip. But we'd better hurry home because the children will be hungry and I have to start dinner. And I'd say, I wonder if Johnny got in the jam again. <laughs> Josephine, I was trying to be gay, but I, I just can't seem to manage it. Do you know how much I love you? Have you got any idea at all? I think I have. I know how much I love you. You've never said that before. Philip, I'm only saying it now because I know I'm never going to see you again. It seems only fair to tell you that I loved you the first moment I saw you. And I think I'll continue to love you as long as I live. What do you mean, you're never going to see me again? I've decided what to do, Philip. Philip. I think I've known all along that I had to do it, but somehow I kept fighting and hoping and praying. 
Now I know it isn't any use. Oh, Philip, if only I'd met you a long time ago. What are you going to do? I'm going to go to Thoreau. Oh, no, you're not. You're going to marry me. I'll never let you go now. Philip! Look out behind you! Well, Monsieur Spahn, Monsieur Dercambeau, we meet again. Oh, do not bother to try anything. As you see, you are one man. Over there, you see, we are 30. Oh, pardon. I have not introduced myself. Don't bother, Thoreau. Thank you for looking after my Josephine for me. I will take her off your hands now. I'll kill you for this. You are very amusing. I like your spirit. You! Philip, don't. They'll kill you. You haven't got a chance. You're a great fighter, Thoreau. You really like fair sport, don't you? Like shooting at a man through a window and knocking him over the head with a rifle. What's the matter with you? Are you afraid of skinning your knuckles? I can do things without skinning my knuckles. There has never been a man that has defied me or disobeyed me that has lived to brag about it. And I have no time to stand here arguing with you. Take care of him, Henri. Oh, Philip! Philip! It was almost dark when I regained consciousness and the sled was still beside me, but... Two of the dogs were dead, and four had evidently been cut loose because they were gone. I staggered to my feet, fighting nausea and blackness that kept sweeping up on me. It was snowing again, and the snow swirled and pressed against me, and the wind tore at me. Sometimes I walked, and sometimes I crawled on my hands and knees. It seemed centuries before I saw the light of the house. I fell up the steps and into Jean's arms. Monsieur! Monsieur, what... What is it? Josephine, Jean, Thoreau, they've carried her off. They carried her off. Oh, mais le bon Dieu, watch over her. Come on. Come on, we've got to go for help. How many were there? Thoreau said 30. And get this sled, you can rest while we're on our way. We will get help, monsieur. We will get help. <laughs> Yes, they're always carried off, Josephine. Will you come with us? I will come at once. Is there anyone home in there? Is there anybody home? What do you want? They're always carried off, Josephine. Will you come with us? The dirty swine, you bet I will come. We need your help. They're always carried off the girl. Will you come with us? Thoreau has taken the girl. Come with us. We reached Thoreau's cabin at dawn. We had gathered 20 strong and angry men. We paused a moment at the foot of the hill. <coughs> They've seen us. Well, why are we waiting? Let us go up and root them out. They can pick us off like flies as we go up that hill. We've got to fight with caution. John, you take 10 of the men and leave me the rest to batter in the door. You can cover the windows with your fire while we rush the door with one of those logs over there. Let us go. Wait. There is something I would like to tell you. I may die today, or you may. I feel you have a right to know. You're going to tell me the baby is Miriam's. Josephine told you? No, I guessed. Uh, Miriam married Thoreau, or thought she did, three years ago. She found out he already had a wife in Quebec. The baby was born here. Josephine's father was ill in Montreal. Miriam went down to see him. He asked her to marry him. She did. And Mr. Adair knew nothing about the baby? No. Miriam was afraid to tell him at first, and later it was too late. Then Thoreau got wind of it, demanded that Josephine marry him. He has always wanted her. He said he would tell Adele everything if she did not. Josephine was in trouble all the way around. She had the baby. She knew her father was come home. So she decided to say baby was hers. She would have been wiser to say it was an orphan baby. I guess she did not think of that. Now she's in the hands of Thoreau. Well, she won't be for long. All right, men, let's go. We started forward carrying the log to batter down the door. They fired at us. One of my log bearers crumpled down without a moan. Instantly, someone sprang forward and took his place. Twenty yards more and a second staggered out of line and sank in the snow. We were only a hundred feet from the door now, but without a rock or a stump between us and death. Another man fell, and then a fourth, and a fifth. But nothing could stop us now. Fifty feet, forty, thirty, another man down, and behind us, John and his men were firing. And then, the door. We broke it down. Then we were in the middle of the fight. Somehow we fought our way out of the house. We were greatly outnumbered. It was every man for himself now. I saw man after man go down, and suddenly I realized that we must lose, that Josephine was lost. And then I heard a sound, and I heard Josephine answer. Captain! 
Sound swept closer, the angry, threatening roar of her own dog pack following the trail her abductors had made. They heard her cries now. They were coming closer, an angry gray horde moving with the speed of the wind. And suddenly they shot out of the forest into the opening. Peroni's men went down before them. They were no match for the dog's anger. They paid with their lives for having provoked it. Well... You're free, Josephine. Yes. It was a terrible thing. But they were terrible men, and they had it coming for a long time. That thing you said I would never guess in a thousand years. I've guessed it, Josephine. But you'll forget it? Yes. I'll forget it on one condition. <laughs> Are you going to practice blackmail, too? Just once and then never again. I'll forget it. If you'll marry me. You still want me? After all the grief and trouble I've caused you? Hey, I never stopped wanting you for a moment. I never will. You see, I want to stay up here and live the rest of my life. And I can't get a certain phrase out of my mind. It makes a lot of sense. What phrase is that? Something I remembered when I first saw you. No country is God's country. Without a woman. Will you marry me, Mrs. Darkumbo? Yes, Mr. Darkumbo. I'll marry you. <laughs> Is it all right with you, Captain? <laughs> And now, a special message to the ladies. Of course, you want to feel and look as young and attractive as you should. But many women are needlessly throwing away their natural youthfulness simply because they fail to live sensibly and get enough certain indispensable vitamins and iron. Ladies, don't let that happen to you. Don't be guilty of throwing away your youthful charm. Just live sensibly and take vitamins plus once each day. Vitamins Plus gives you full protective amounts of all the certain indispensable vitamins and iron you must have to feel and look as young as you should. So be sure to make it your health charm routine. Vitamins Plus, just once each day. I am Adventure. Next week, meet a dashing, debonair French prince who masqueraded as a barber to find an honest Cinderella. Booth Tarkington's famous story, Monsieur Beaucaire. Until next week, then, I am dangerously yours. Our script was written by Gene Holloway from the book by James Oliver Curwood, God's Country and the Woman, and directed by Richard Sandville. Music for the series is under the direction of Mark Warno. The part of Josephine was played by Claire Neeson. Be sure and listen in again next week when Vix presents Dangerously Yours, starring Victor Jory. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System.